I quiz, I expect to do that tomorrow, but um, it probably won't be the same quiz that I ever gave before or ever give again. So um, if you want to look at them to see the style of the questions, that's probably a good idea. Or if you've had any other classes, VIT 3 or anything like that, but uh, my style of asking questions is usually to define something or to give a number of reasons why something is true or uh, to... Um, uh, very occasionally to write a short essay on a general subject. Uh, for example, I would think that it would be fair, I don't say that I'll do this, but it would be fair on almost any one of those uh, 42 list of uh, chemical compounds and so forth to write a short essay on what the taste is, or odor is due to and, um, and uh, <laughs> what importance it might have. Well, it isn't very long. After all, it's, it's, it's only five pages of text, really, is all it is. It, uh, <laughs> well, after all, it's so, you get so much valuable information, you see, that you really... Um, <laughs> now, uh, one other thing. Uh, the first um, labs have been corrected. I went over um, about... 10 or 12 of them myself this morning, and uh, Mr. Weaver seems to have um, done a good job. This, uh, the um, grades were 77 to 100 or something like that, and I don't have an average, but um, I would guess the average was around uh, 85, just going through them and, uh, with the scores. Um, so the, the first lab reports without any penalty are due before 2 o'clock. If you haven't got them ready right now, you better go spend the next hour out there doing that lab report. Uh, there are only 56 of them, and that brings me to a very hard problem, but I'm going to have to solve it. Uh, with 71 people taking the lab, and we've counted them now, and 56 lab reports, the Department of Finance is on my neck. We cannot, repeat, we cannot spend university money on wines or equipment or chemicals uh, and so forth without a person being enrolled in the class. So there is... 15 people at least in the laboratories that shouldn't be there. If you're not signed up, uh, you better just not come because there are <laughs> ways that I can take care of that if I have to. All right, we, I said I would talk about the um, taste for a few minutes and what kind of research has been done on taste before we go on to this question of wine types. And uh, I will not... Um, uh, do any quizzing on wine types. It will only be on the five lectures that you have now. Most wines uh, uh, do not have an acid taste that's too much, except in regions of very cool climate, and uh, in those cases where we get pHs down around three, uh, we do get um, uh, wines that have too acid or too sour a taste. Now, people vary on this very much, however. There are some people that cannot take wines that have too much acid. Some people are about twice as efficient as others in getting the acid. Uh, we've tested the order of acidity of um, a number of compounds, and these have some effect in wines. Uh, the, at the same titratable acidity, that is, if we have maintained the acidity at 7 tenths percent for all the acids, the order of uh, tartness is uh, malic is greater than tartaric and citric is less than tartaric and lactic is the least. So that you can see right away, right there is the reason why the malolactic fermentation has such great importance for reducing the acid taste. When malic acid is converted down to lactic, you go from the strongest acid taste down to the least strong acid taste at the same titratable acidity. Now, if you reduce the titratable acidity, as you do due to the decarboxylation, that is, you're removing one COOH group, uh, then uh, you further, you reduce the titratable acidity, and uh, you still have lactic acid. So it will taste much less acid than uh, the acidity will, uh, will um, indicate, since you've gone from malic to lactic acid. If you kept the pH the same, the order is different, however. The order is malic, lactic, citric, and tartaric. And uh, since this work was done here, uh, I think it's, or at least I hope it's, uh, it was good. And uh, that means that um, 
uh, the, the difference is not so great if pH controls the acid taste, which brings me to the subject, what is it that makes the acid taste? The textbook says that it's the hydrogen ion concentration, and therefore it should be proportional to the pH. But if you try and relate the acid taste to pH, you do not get very good correlations. Uh, if you try and relate the acid taste to the titratable acidity, uh, assuming that then that um, some of the acid salts were affecting the acid taste, that doesn't give you a very uh, good um, uh, correlation either. Uh, I've reached the personal conclusion that the acid taste is a function both of pH and of titratable acidity, but I have not made any correlations of those myself. It's incredible how small a differences we can uh, distinguish. 0.05 uh, pH unit uh, were uh, easily detectable, and uh, the um, titratable acidity of 0.02 to 0.05 percent. So that in standardizing and quality control work, if you're operating in a large winery, the um, you have to control these uh, determinations rather carefully because uh, even small differences in titratable acidity or pH will be detectable by your potential audience. And therefore, if you're trying to standardize the acid taste as always being the same. Now, you could, of course, uh, do a lot of, uh, of uh, consumer studies or panel studies to do this, but now that we know that the panel can detect uh, differences of down to 0.05 pH unit, or 0.02 to 0.05 percent titratable acidity. Uh, if we come within those limits, it's quite unlikely that the public will find those. These thresholds in water, I don't think, are very much uh, important to you. The different thresholds in water are not um, uh, important either. Sucrose did not have any effect on acid thresholds in water, but tannin increased the acid threshold. We're not quite certain why that. It's true. Alcohol, I can understand why that might increase the threshold. Uh, alcohol itself has a slight sweet taste, and therefore it might be some effective contrast that was making the different thresholds. Uh, lack of, of, um, of effective contrast. Better say that all over again. Sucrose has no effect on acid thresholds in water, uh, but uh, tannin tended to increase the uh, difference thresholds. Uh, in the absence of sugar. And alcohol increased the difference threshold. And the effect was greater if sucrose was present. I don't really know the reason for that. In wine, a difference threshold, when the titratable acidity was 0.74%, the difference threshold was 0.15%. Now that's much greater than we got in the studies that we made here. We were using ranking as the method of doing these studies here. And I think ranking is more sensitive in this case. Uh, than uh, triangular taste tests or duo trio tests or other kinds of tests. Now the bitter taste is a, a semantic problem. Many people call the acid taste the bitter taste. And uh, you'll find differences in communicating even with people who are fairly knowledgeable about wine as to whether or not the wine is truly bitter or whether it has um, um, uh, just a, a too high an acid taste and it therefore gives you a bitter impression. Uh, the bitter taste is the puckery character. It's, it's the true tannin characteristic. Uh, it's the tannin reacting with the taste buds in the back of the mouth uh, and uh, literally drying them out is the effect that they get. They, the characteristic, if you want the most characteristic bitter taste, it's persimmons, green persimmons, which, as you know, pucker up the inside of the mouth and particularly affect the taste buds. It's not quite certain whether there are not some surface effects of some tannin compound, so that you may not only get a bitter taste, a true taste, but you may also may get a texture effect, as you do get from too high an alcohol content, where you get a texture effect. The uh, results that were done here show that experienced tasters were better than inexperienced tasters. I think that's because they knew what to look for. And uh, the, uh, um, the um, difference thresholds were around one-tenth percent, which is much too high. I think that was probably uh, 
fact that we're using triangular taste tests at that time, and they may have gotten some confusion and therefore statistically got rather high uh, thresholds or difference thresholds. We have a number of, uh, of bitter compounds that have been found in wines by various people. Uh, acrolein, you can all understand that one, and divenylglycol. But uh, these uh, tannin materials like epicatechin, uh, that should be delta and labo, uh, dextro and labo epicatechin. You see it's not very well written. Uh, rutin, uh, which is a flavonoid, and hesperidin and naringin have all been found in various wines and all cause bitter taste. Uh, Norinogen is very bitter. It's the same compound that makes the inside um, paper-like material in grapefruit taste bitter. You eat the flesh of the grapefruit and you leave the little dividing tissues part. Those dividing tissues are very high in norinogen and uh, they are very bitter. In fact, that's one of the problems in making um, uh, grapefruit juice is not to in reaming the inside of the grapefruit out, not to uh, destroy the, or break up the uh, little texture tissues that separate the flesh and get it into the grapefruit juice, and then you have better grapefruit juice. The sweet taste, well, we all seem to have some knowledge about it in general because it's one of the most appreciated of tastes. It's, uh, the sweetest is fructose, which is normally about half of the sugar content of wines. Uh, most of you are familiar with my proposal that we should breed grapes that are high in fructose and then we could ferment, out, ferment them out further and still have the same degree of sweetness. Uh, fructose is about one and a half times as sweet as dextrose. So if we could um, uh, do that we would, uh, we would have a um, possibility with less reducing sugar having the same degree of sweetness. The other suggestion that I've made is that we should find some yeast that will only ferment glucose and will not ferment uh, le uh, fructose. And that would leave the fructose as the residual sugar being essentially biologically stable. Neither one of those projects that seem to catch on with the geneticists or the yeast people, but I still say they're both very much, uh, very practical. There isn't any sucrose in wines or very little sucrose in wines. Uh, because it hydrolyzes. However, uh, those people who are making flavored wines and who are using 10% uh, sucrose uh, and uh, are using very neutral and low acid um, uh, wines as a part of the base may find that there is residual sucrose under some conditions. So that uh, in those, that particular case where there's lots of water being used and uh, along with the sugar, there may indeed be some uh, sucrose present. The glycerol and 2,3-butanediol are both sweet but less sweet than fructose and a little bit less sweet than, than um, uh, glucose, although uh, uh, glycerol approaches the sweetness of, um, of, um, of glucose. You can see that the thresholds for fructose in water was only 0.14 on the average percent whereas the glucose threshold was around 4 and the glycerin threshold was around 4 tenths percent in water. In wines, the, the thresholds are much higher than that. The thresholds uh, in wine uh, uh, tend to be around 1.5%. And that figure of 1.5% was the reason why when we went to sweet rosés that we fixed upon 1.5%. That will be perceived by only 50% of the population as being sweet. Uh, and so um, they, the industry felt that was a good place. They are potentially unstable wines. They still have fermentable sugar. The difference thresholds in water are fairly small. The difference thresholds get larger in wine, as you can see uh, by the chart. Uh, and they get... Uh, the difference thresholds get larger as the sugar content goes up. So if you have 0% sugar, uh, you can taste a difference of about uh, 1%, a little less than 1% uh, in white wine and red wine, the difference thresholds. That is, you have to go up to about 1 to find a difference. 
But if you have 1%, it's about the same, still nearly 1. At 5%, it's just 1% difference threshold. But if you have a 10% sweetness, the difference threshold goes to above 1.5, 1.7, 1.6. The uh, threshold in water for glycerol is 1.5%. So that's fairly uh, much more than glucose, even though in water solution they have about the same threshold. Incidentally, in, in, um, if um, you ferment fructose, there is slightly more production of glycerol, so there would be other reasons for having high fructose varieties. You'd get wines with higher glycerol content. And if glycerol has any effect on texture, why, that would give you more glycerol, and you'd not have to have the fructose as high in order to get the same degree of sweetness. So it'd have a double advantage if all of our grape varieties had um, fructose instead of glucose. Um, well, I've already lectured on the last part. Let's go now to this question of um, uh, what do you um, label? How do you label wines? And um, the next Monday we'll start on talking about different kinds of wines. Well, first of all, you could give it the variety label with or without various kinds of subs of other kinds of of, um, lab of uh, things on the label. Uh, first of all, you could give the time of harvest influence, uh, early or late harvest. There are California wines that have been marked late harvested and early harvested. Palmasan just a year or so ago came out with a late harvested wine. Or you could use the German word spate lazy, which means late picking in its own right, or aus lazy to pick out on a special kind of grapes or beer and house lazy and so forth. Not used very much in Sauterne anymore is the old French tries. It has the same origin as to try. They go and pick part of the crop and then go back later and pick part of the crop. That some years they made as many as four, five, and six tries when labor was cheap. But now that labor is expensive, the practice has practically died out. This has an advantage of differentiating for the consumer uh, two different kinds of wines from the same grapes from the same field. Uh, wines which will be drier and less alcoholic and more tart, and wines which will be sweeter and uh, more alcoholic and uh, less tart, uh, hoping to get a broader audience on those. Incidentally, I might say that in many of these um, things of this kind, I'm not trying consciously, at least, to make a value judgment. I couldn't care less at my age and my professional position, whether you put them all as late harvested or early harvested or no harvested. It doesn't make any difference to me at all. I'm not, what I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to preach about these things. I'm just trying to report that these things exist in the industry. And it doesn't mean that I recommend them. I might or might not put late harvesting on my labels or might, might put them on. I don't have any expertise at all in predicting what consumer reactions to these would be. So I'm not really trying in any way to influence practices in this. I'm simply reporting what I see in the industry. Second would be the crop in influence. And this would only, I think, be uh, important on the label uh, where there is some sort of legal uh, um, uh, restrictions. And those of you who had bit three know that appellations of origin in France and Germany and now to a lesser extent in Italy do control the amount of crop that when the crop gets to be above a certain level, you lose the right of the appellation, and you have to use some lesser appellation for it. So that in that sense, when you see an appellation controlly on a French label, or now the, the new kinds of labels in Germany, you are guaranteed that the farmer did not overcrop and thus produce wines of lesser quality. This is built into the appellation controlly law. We do not have any of those restrictions in California. In fact, I've just been looking at some pruning in the Napa Valley the last couple of weeks. And it's a good thing we don't, that's all I can say. Um, and it, wh who, can, who can blame the farmer at $1,000 a ton? Wouldn't you? Certainly you would. Most of us would anyway. Unless we had some law that said don't do that. And uh, we don't have any such law. Now the, uh, the vintage dating or the, is... Um, used all over the world, including California. And there are some differences. 
uh, it, it was no it took no trick at all to differentiate the 1967 versus the 1968 wines with no exceptions that I know of but uh, some friends have said they've seen one or two exceptions uh, the 67s were less good than the 68s uh, for the Reds in Napa Valley uh, the 1967s all had a lack of balance the the acid alcohol was out of balance and they all seem to have had some sort of odor that was not present in the 68s I'm not able to describe the odor but as one of my friends in the valley said the 67 stank and they in the industry tastings it showed up that way and the wines that I've had they've shown up that way fortunately you can't buy any more 67 so far as I know so you won't have to make that comparison the 1969, 70, and 71 Bordeaux, I have now, just now, quite recently tasted a 71, and I've tasted a number of 70s, and a fair number of 69s. The 70s are all the better. They have a little bit more alcohol, a little bit more color, a little bit better balance. They have more color because of the higher alcohol to extract the color. And uh, there's no doubt in anybody's mind, and the prices are also reflecting that. Although the general trend in Bordeaux prices to go up which tends to cover this up by the 71s selling almost as high as the 70s. The 70s are still more expensive uh, than the 71s. And in the Moselle, just the opposite situation happened. Uh, I haven't tasted the 71s, but the people that I have confidence in have told me that the 70s are not as good as the 71. So you cannot use any one year in Bordeaux or in California for everybody. Though I'm sure there were some good wines made in 67. Uh, but some were not. I personally uh, feel that the, uh, as a consumer now, without making an industry judgment, that there is some things to be said in favor of giving the consumer information on this, unless you can go into large-scale storage and large-scale uh, uh, blending, which creates other economic problems. Question? Yes, sir. The numbers that you see on bottles are mostly bottling dates rather than uh, vintage Not in Europe. Not in Europe. Not in Europe. No. The year that they were made. I don't think it is here either. It's the year of the vintage. It's the year they were made. Uh, you may see in port that it was bottled when it was three years old or four years old and things like that. But it's the year on the bottle should be the year when the wine is made. In fact, that's what the law reads. That's what the law reads. Of course, now they have it down to the 90% rule, but even so, that's still pretty good. Now, the soil influence, direct and indirect effects, well, that has stimulated quite a large number of... Uh, of uh, label restrictions. Uh, the village or the vineyard labeling in Europe or two vineyards belonging to the same company with different labels on them. Um, and of course the all of the Appalachian Control E laws of Italy, of Spain, of um, France and of Germany, those four countries, all of which have Appalachian origin laws which restrict the region imply that there's some soil effect or soil and climate effect. Now what could be the reason for the soil effect as separated from the climate effect? I can't find a single soil scientist in the University of California that can name me one good good one. Uh, if you say that, uh, that it's because of the high calcium content, try and find some direct effect of calcium on the chemical composition of uh, uh, grapes. Uh, it's very hard to find any direct effect. Or if it's potassium. Potassium is supposed to be related to photosynthesis and so forth. But at the amounts of potassium that are already present and the growth of, uh, uh, of uh, land and so forth, it's kind of hard to figure very much direct effect. I've come to the conclusion that most of the soil induced effects are coming from something besides the mineral content of the soil, they're coming from other things. And one of them would certainly be uh, the effects of soil drainage, uh, which would, uh, in soils that were not well drained, in wet areas, which include most of Europe, uh, would raise, the, would, would waterlog the, the um, uh, ground at a higher level, thus restricting root growth, and would also lower the soil temperature because uh, water has uh, uh, changes temperature uh, very much less fast than does air. So if you have a well-drained soil 
as you get this movement of temperature above the surface of the soil, you would expect the soil temperatures to change more than it would be if they were, if they were waterlogged. And it does, although the effects are not great. One, two, or three degrees. But if you figure that it is three degrees, let's say it's three degrees in the microclimate where the grapes are grown within the first two or three feet, that's 180 degrees of a month. And a four month period, that's 480 degrees between a well-drained soil and a not well-drained <coughs> soil. And those, of course, are influenced by soil composition and soil texture, so that there can be some effects, but I think they're more likely to be indirect effects. Another kind of effect of um, the soil is on the Moselle, where they actually put slate under the, the vines to uh, warm up during the daytime and then give off their heat during the nighttime in order to raise the general temperature of that. Uh, there can be some other land effects, the proximity to large bodies of water. Uh, the, the, we've had a very dramatic demonstration of that just in the last five years. Uh, the Moselle canals and dams were constructed since the war, and the Moselle has now become a long lake, all the way from Trier on the Luxembourg border, all the way up to Koblenz. The Moselle River is raised some 10 or 15 feet and represents a navigable stream, which it wasn't before, and a great big lake. The average temperature has gone up one or two degrees because of this large body of water along there, which holding in the heat at night and so forth. And uh, the Moselle wine, so we've had more good years in the Moselle during the last five years, and the sugar contents have been higher than they've ever been before in history. So there is a, and we have other places like that too, the proximity to large bodies of water to cut down on frost damage, as for example, the Great Lakes, uh, Lake Erie particularly. Now processed influenced, some of these occur on the labels and some of them don't. Uh, late discouraged champagne, there is, there is one on the market right now that's called, um, you know, what's the French word for late discouraged? I can't think of the name. It's Boulanger is the one that's put it out. And I've forgotten the initials at the moment, but I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, RD, yes. Ray, uh, um, um, discouragement and retard or something like that. Any, uh, well, I don't know exactly whether it means that or not, but that's what it, what it is. Uh, I haven't seen any others of those. Oh yes, and, uh, and Hans Cornell has a, a late discouraged wine on the market, which we tasted in this class just a year ago. Uh, so there's two of them that are on the labels at the present time. There are quite a number of, uh, of wineries that now uh, distinguish between uh, uh, wines made with only white grapes and white wines made from red grapes. Almaden has a Blanc de Blanc Chardonnay, for example, in the market. Schramsberg has a Blanc de Noir uh, sparkling wine on the market uh, uh, with the, that information right on the bottle. Settled or not settled next to the fermentation, that, that I don't find on any labels. Early or late bottled, that's very common for port. Late bottled uh, 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 vintage ports as against the regularly two-year bottled vintage ports and so forth. Uh, blended or not, and the varieties used, yes, we do get back labels for that information quite commonly. Uh, they will list the varieties if there are blends, or if there are no blends, they will tell you why they used a certain uh, 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 variety. Uh, the bottle versus the tank process, that is required by law in the United States and also abroad. Temperature of fermentation, uh, there's been an Australian label that says cool fermentation is against normal fermentation. Uh, that's the only one that I know has occurred on the label, but of course it would make a difference which one you were fermenting at. The time of pressing, the, those differences do occur and create differences in the quality of the wine or the character of the wine, but I don't know that any of those have been found on a label yet. The size and type of cooperage, that regularly occurs on German labels. The Foss number or the Fuder number uh, are regularly given, or in the case of Trockenbeer and Auslazies, uh, they may give a uh, half Fuder number or even a quarter Fuder number where they have very little. Uh, let's see if I can say it right now. Uh, Fooder is 1,200 liters and a Foss is 1,000 liters. I believe that's correct. Maybe the other way around. One, one is on the Mosul and the other is on the Rhine. But 1,000 liters uh, divided by, let's say, four is about 300 gallons. So th th that information is given on a number of labels. And then a que the question whether they're baked or not, reduced must. Well, first of all, baked. That's not normally given. But uh, the question whether it's submerged culture is, uh, Palmasan has just put on the market last week a new sherry, which they are advertising 
uh, straight away that it um, uh, contains a floor sherry and I'm sure it's submerged culture. Uh, the Fino against the Oloroso for Spanish ones indicates whether they used a film yeast or did not use a film yeast in making uh, the sherry. So that occurs on labels. And reduced must is not put on the labels of uh, Marsalas, but it might very well be. Well, the vintage wine problem, let me say just a few more words about it. There are some very distinct legal problems about it. Until last year, it had to be 100% in California of the, of the year named, and it had to be continuously kept full from wine of that same year. And this caused economic hardships. You had a thousand gallon barrel or tank, and you ran out of fill-up material. Uh, you couldn't even buy wine from somebody else. You had to have it your own production. It had to be your own production, and you could only use the wine of a given year. So that meant that you had to break it down to a 500 gallon tank and a 300 gallon tank and 350 gallon barrels and so forth. And uh, now they have said that you can use other wine up to either five or 10 percent. And I believe that they're not looking as close at those uh, 702 forms as they did before. But even if you do put a vintage label on it, you run into all kinds of distribution problems. Uh, the People at a restaurant get fond of one vintage, and they, when it doesn't, isn't available, why well, they think the restaurant's to blame. I had a call just yesterday from a club I belong to in Sacramento, saying, what could I do to help them get some more 68 Zinfandel from a winery in the valley? They, they've been selling a lot of it, and they've established a demand for it at their dinners uh, once a month, and uh, could I do anything for them? And I said, I, I couldn't do anything for them. I had trouble getting it myself, let alone getting it for them. Um, and in restaurants, of course, they have to print wine list, and you have a nice big printed wine list, and the day after you uh, have got it all printed and on the table, somebody comes in and gives a party for 50 people and orders 12 bottles, and your list is out of date immediately. Um, so there, there, I don't know what this, which is best in that situation. Now there are some chemical things that appear on label and affect types of wine. The alcohol content. Uh, first of all, it's direct physiological effect, but it also has some other effects, uh, the alcohol content. I've already indicated one of them. The, it tends to be a carrier of odors. Uh, wine without its alcohol does not have as much Cabernet odor as a wine with it. And it also softens the acid taste, If you, de as I pointed out last time, if you de-alcoholize a wine, even under a very good vacuum, and taste it, it will taste very unbalanced and very rough and uh, harsh and uh, uh, unpleasant uh, so that the alcohol is a necessary part of wines as we know them. And alcohol is required because of the tax problem. Since there is a special tax on wines in varying countries of varying percents of alcohol, uh, it's necessary to state the alcohol content in the label of most countries. The sugar content occurs on the labels in Yugoslavia, in Yugoslavia, fairly often, not always, occasionally for export. The same thing is true in the Soviet Union. They will put the sugar content right on the label, say it's 2% sugar and so forth. Whenever I mention that as being a very good idea for diabetics and even for the general public in California, I get a very nasty letter from the Wine Institute saying that I'm sabotaging the industry efforts and that of course you don't want to put that information on the label because uh, people want to read, dry, and drink sweet. And we would be destroying the rosé industry of California. <laughs> <laughs> and I try and recover my equilibrium and keep saying that to classes and um, at least I'm free here. Um, <laughs> but. Um, there is nobody that I know of in this country that's ever do done that. Although I think it would have many advantages and, uh, and uh, actually make some sense. Why should I be forced to drink a sweet rosé when I don't want a sweet rosé, I want a dry rosé? Or vice versa. Why should I be forced to drink a dry rosé when I want a sweet rosé? And I think I should know ahead of time. Yes? You bought a wine and you thought it was dry and it was sweet. Could you get, take it back? No, I don't think so. If you bought, I can tell you, well, I'll give you an example. Or, if you bought Krug Chenin Blanc and it was dry, then I think you might have a right to send it back because all Krug Chenin Blancs have been sweet since the word go, since they first made them, and it's all usually around three, three and a half percent sugar. So in that case, you, you, somebody's doing funny things in the back. 
I'd at least get a, I'd get at least get the label pulled right at the table, so I'd see it. But uh, and if you bought martini, it would normally be dry. But if you're buying something you don't know anything about, and you think it's going to be dry and it comes out sweet, I don't think you have any recourse at all. I certainly wouldn't feel I have any recourse. Now the acids, uh, as far as I know, they are not put on any labels. I, I'd certainly think it would be a good idea in the case of Germans uh, wines, which are frequently rather tart. They have some other important effects, of course. They affect the color. They have a direct effect on the taste. They affect the appearance of the wine and so forth. And the same thing of tannin. I, I think it's wishing for too much for somebody to tell us what the tannin content is. Um, when you think, however, uh, whether these are important or not, just look on your next bottle of, a, of any well-known brand of mineral water, not Calso, well, even Calso, I think it occurs now, uh, where they give you uh, 15 different minerals in their exact amounts uh, in the mineral water, or Perry water, or any of the French or Italian waters. will have not only a list of all the chemicals and their percents in the water, but usually uh, some pharmacist certificate that you actually found this amounts and so forth. So I don't think it's uh, really too far-fetched to think about these things. The um, sugar-acid ratio does have a direct effect of its own as separate from the sweetness and the acid. It's a separate entity. They do usually give us pretty good information about the color, although there's a lot of ports that we think are ruby ports, but they're really tawny ports. You'll probably be seeing some of those in class. And it's almost impossible to find uh, uh, where the break between rosé wines occur and... Um, the break between um, red wines occur. There are at least two or three uh, rosé wines that I know on the market right now that have as much color as some other companies' claret has. There is no industry agreement upon these at all. The, um, the other things I think are pretty well taken care of. Are added flavors, well, of course, these differences in aging process, and so forth uh, do affect the bouquet, how long they are, old they are, and so forth. It's the reason for putting a vintage date on so that we can tell how old a red wine is. The wood uh, flavor, uh, once in a while you will see a back label in California that will say this wine was aged for one year or two years uh, in uh, French oak, or right now in French oak, of course, that being the thing that little god that everybody bows down to. But uh, the, um, it would give me an idea of which Chardonnays not to drink sometimes if they'd tell me how long they left it in wood. They commonly use it in advertising now. This is very common. So even if it's not a part of the label directly, you'll see that in their public relations and the articles they release for magazines and things like that, they tell you quite a bit about this kind of information. The herbs are not um, listed in, in vermouth, although there may be some movement in that direction in the future. Sparkling wines, of course, we know what they have in the floor. The rancio, that term I better explain. It's a fancy word for very old, dry red wine, usually of fairly high alcohol content, 17, 18% alcohol. They form acetaldehyde. They're kept in non-full casks, sometimes in glass in the sun, not full. And with time, uh, they become brown, they get acetaldehyde formation, and in the case of 17-18% red wines at about 40 years of age, they also form some acetal, which has a very specialized uh, flavor. Sophistication, there is a certain amount of legitimate sophistication. The use of oak extract, for example, I don't find anything wrong with that. It's been used in a number of parts of the world. The trouble with that is that people tend to overdo it. Using the great American frontier motto, if a little bit is good, more is better. And so if it says to add two drops to the 50 gallons, they add four drops. And then it begins to get that medicinal character of extracted oak flavors and so forth. There was a famous uh, case here in California before um, the war of a sparkling burgundy, which was favored with raspberry syrup. Uh, if they had just left it with, you know, a couple of drops or something like that, it would have been all right. But when you opened the cork and the raspberries came right out of the bottle, whole, uh, it was too much. And um, it was also one of blackberry. 
Now some ex other examples of what the labels say. Proprietary labels, these are where they are created. Uh, they're also the use of these words produced and bottled by uh, have a certain amount of uh, importance uh, for it. Uh, I've given you some other examples here which we'll go over very quickly. Uh, variety proprietary that is made by a certain man and uh, variety vineyard proprietary in the year. Variety time of harvest vineyard proprietary in the year. We'll have examples of these in the class. In California, the 75% rule applies on the region or nationwide too. If it says um, within California, let me make that straight again. I didn't say that right. I'll correct myself. Inside of California, if it says California, it must be 100% by California, uh, from California grapes and made in California by law, uh, state law. Federally wise, however, whether it's California wine or New York wine, it only has to conform to New York, uh, to, to federal standards, and that is 75% of wine from the region will entitle it to a uh, region uh, label. So if you see a wine that says New York State wine, or if you see a California wine in Illinois, they guarantee you at least 75% is from New York or from California. You can be pretty certain that if they say it's an American wine, it doesn't have 75% from a given region. So if you see X winery that you know exists in New York selling American Burgundy, the presumption is that more than 25% of it's from California. Because if it was 75% from New York, they would call it New York Burgundy, not American Burgundy. At least that's the, the theory. There are some of these um, words that we don't have very good enforcement uh, regulations. The use of the word Napa Valley Rosé should theoretically be 75% from Napa Valley. Or perhaps even 100% under California rule if you extend the California regulation down to sections of California. And the industry itself is quite divided upon this particular point. Some of the industries say that if it's Napa Valley, it ought to be 100% from Napa Valley. Others say that only the 75% rule applies because the California law only applies to the use of the word California and doesn't apply to political subdivisions of the state itself. Um, I'd be quite happy if the 75% rule applied all the time. That would be my hope, that, that there was no Napa Valley wine or there was no Sonoma County wine or there was no uh, Salinas Valley wine that was... Uh, not less than 75% of the region named. Let me, yes, sir. I'm just saying that California red then only has to have 75% California wine. If it's sold outside of California. If it's sold outside of California. If it's sold inside of California, it has to be 100%. But that can come from Central Valley? Any place in California, yes. And the, the confusion is whether Napa Valley should apply the same rule of 100% to the political subdivisions of California or whether the federal regulation of 75% should apply to districts of California. And you can get a very nice argument with any number of California wine proprietors on that, that particular subject. Um, the Bordeaux system uh, favors uh, rather large district things, and I'll be lecturing on that in a couple of weeks, so I won't go into any further detail on it, but uh, there they have a very large district which would be more or less comparable to a state uh, divided into communes, uh, uh, parts of the, uh, the, excuse me, a very large district which would be comparable to a state divided into districts which would be comparable to the Napa Valley and divided into townships in the Napa Valley or what they call communes. So they have a three-layered system, three-layered district system, which they can label at any one of the three, at the lowest level, at the commune level, a uh, bigger level at a slightly larger subdivision uh, like a county and a very large division like Bordeaux itself for the whole district like a state. And you find all kinds of mixtures of these. You find some things that will just have the village with the proprietor who made and grew the wine. Let me say a word or two about a state bottling. That's a, a word I wish could be defined. It's gotten further and further apart. The original meaning of a state model means that you made the wine at a certain vineyard and uh, you uh, um, 
produced it from grapes that were at that vineyard, and then you sold it, and when you said it was, the grapes were grown, it was produced, and it was bottled by the man, that meant that it had to come just from that um, uh, one um, uh, state bottling. But uh, what are you going to do when the, when the winery is owned by a cooperative? All the people are the owners, and so you say it's, they, they, they feel that they should be entitled to say that it is um, um, produced and bottled by this winery on our own uh, vineyards. And uh, they're doing that, as a matter of fact. And they've made it stick so far. Uh, and you can imagine other problems. Uh, a, a man that owns a winery in, um, uh, in Napa County, and he also owns a winery on the border of Sonoma County. Same climatic condition and so forth. And he ferments them all at the same place. And he wants to uh, give them a district name, Napa Sonoma or whatever it might be. Uh, and that, that runs into problems too. Whether or not it should be allowed to be subdivided or should it not be allowed to be subdivided. In fact, uh, nobody has really thought through the geographical appellations for California at the present time. And of course, they create lots of problems abroad. They are under constant serve. Uh, surveillance in France, for example, which has the largest system, it only requires 28 volumes to give all the regulations on Appalachian of origin for, for France alone. And when you realize that only about 20 to 30 percent of all the French wines are entitled to an Appalachian of origin, that's only about 300 million gallons. So 28 volumes of laws to regulate uh, Appalachians of origin for California, which produces about 300 million gallons a year, same as the French Appalachian of origins would be. Um, the generic system I'd like to say just a word about. I have no, um, I can see, and it's not my personal opinion, I can see very little objection to the long established use of Burgundy and uh, Sherry, if you wish, and Port and Champagne. But uh, I, there are two points that I want to make about it. One is that it seems to me there is some obligation to make the Burgundies more or less resemble each other, even if they don't resemble the French wine in any way. But uh, when you say California Burgundy, you must have some idea what it means. But when the California Burgundy and the California Claret all come out of the same barrel, uh, or the same tank, uh, and they change every year, the quality control is such that one year comes out of the Claret tank and the next year it comes out of the Burgundy tank. That seems to me to be somewhat um, avoiding the real issue of what labels should mean. They should describe what's in the bottle as best you can for the sake of the consumer whom we're trying to please. The other one it seems to me is that we are making, uh, we're saying that the Burgundy is a Burgundy and we're asking, really asking the public to compare it to the wines from the French region of Burgundy. And that then brings up whose standard are you going to apply to the wine? If you apply uh, the French standard of Burgundy, and after all they have several hundred years on us in origin, originating the type, then you have to set up the standards on the basis of what a French Burgundy is, and the California Burgundies are thus not going to appeal so much because they're going to not be made from Pinot Noir, they're not going to be made from the same climatic conditions and the same small cooperage and so forth. And so they're always going to come out second. And then you get these invidious comparisons about the second-rate wines. They may sell a lot and so forth, but they still are, they give that impression to many people. And so that it might be better to, if we had started early enough, it's perhaps too late now, uh, to have created some new and unique terms for uh, California red wine. If we have to have, a, and we do have to have, it seems to me, uh, blended, uh, general, competitive uh, California red wine on the market. Some lovely new name uh, would be useful. The public would soon start to use it. They wouldn't make any invidious comparisons with any wines from any place else in the world. And, which would be more important, people would forget the French names right away quickly. Uh, I've said before, and this is a value judgment now, uh, since I'm going to put a dollar value on it, uh, that if we had given up the name Burgundy in 1932, the French would have to be spending $5 million a year to keep the word Burgundy uh, current in the American market because nobody would know what, if you said Burgundy, after all, two old generations almost have gone by now, and if two generations had never seen the word Burgundy on any label, 
in the, except an imported bottle of wine, they would simply say, well, what's Burgundy? And it would just kill the sales of French Burgundies in this country, or at least restrict them very much. Uh, at least that's my feeling in that particular matter. All right, uh, Doug has the papers. If you bring them up, because they're in alphabetical order. Now, uh, I think Randy's done a good job on these. If you would check with Randy if you have some... Yeah.